Me, Madam Clerk. Councilmember Von Rudenberg. Here. Deputy Mayor Canestrino. Here. Deputy Mayor Sims. Running late. Councilmember Battaglia. Here. Mayor LaBrosse. Here. Hang on. <laughs> this meeting is being held in accordance with the Open Public Meeting Act and JSA 1074-6 at SEC. Notice having been published according to law with a copy on file in the City Clerk's Office and a copy posted on the bulletin board in City Hall. Thank you. Would everybody please rise for the flag salute? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. And that will go right to the agenda, Mr. City Manager. Good evening, Mayor and Council and invited guests. This is the Committee of the Whole Agenda for December 17th, 2019. First is a discussion. I underline the word discussion of the residential parking stickers for the streets of Hamilton Place from Prospect to Vanderbeek Place, Vanderbeek Place to Passaic Street to the Dead End, Franklin Place, Franklin Place, from Passaic Street to Prospect Ave, Anderson Street from Linden Street to Prospect Ave, and Clarendon's Place, Clarendon Place from Passaic Street to Anderson Street. Uh, there were sticker, uh, stickers, there was a um, attention uh, document sent out to all the Hackensack residents in reference to this. There was uh, acknowledgement that there would be a discussion of this tonight. Um, for residents to have concerns or issues for it. And we are here tonight to discuss the consideration of I issuing um, parking permits for residents in this area. Okay, with that, I'll open, I need a motion open to the public. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Anybody from the public who'd like to speak about this parking issue, please come forward. Give your name and address to the clerk, and I guess we'll keep it to three minutes and try to keep the time regulated. Good evening. Good evening. Judith man. Carter, 214 Hamilton Place, Hackensack. Um, on Hamilton Place, the, the ones that live there, we have, we go out, we come home where there's nowhere to park. People are coming in there parking. They're flying down the street. And I also want to ask for a handicap sign for me. Because when we come in, when I come in, whether I'm going to my grandson's basketball game or something functioning at the school, I come home, I have nowhere to park. I have to go all the way up almost by Prospect and Summit to park and then walk back down the street because of people coming around parking on our block. And we had asked before for someone to come out there and watch to, uh, because people were flying down the street. They're coming down that street too fast, like they were on Route 80, and it needs to stop. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you, because you brought up two separate issues totally from different a little bit from what we're talking about. Now, the handicaps sticker, you would have to go through our traffic division and apply for that. That's a totally for separate. Sign, to for the, with, yeah, to have a handicap spot. And they will not designate it just to you, but they will put a handy, possibly put a handicap spot there. Mm -hmm. But they never designate it just to the person. Um, in other words, so if there was another handicapped person in that area parking, they could actually park in that spot. Mm -hmm. um, but what are your feelings on the issue with the parking stickers that we're looking no, to No, we would get them if you are going to um, distribute them to us because this way at least we know if we go out, we come home, there's somewhere for us to park. Because but, people are parking their cars there and they leave their cars there for days. Right. Because you know we have that alternate side parking. Mm -hmm. So if we want to go on the other side of the street, we can't get there because someone has left their car there for a week. Or Do you four think it's days. somebody's from out, out of the area parking I, there for a week no at a time? I have no idea where they're from. Yeah, that's kind of strange. No, I have no favor, idea. So you're in favor of you're the, in favor of the parking stickers. stickers. Okay. Here, here's the reason this came to be. We get complaints from people like you're, you're very close to a train station. Yes. And we know people take the train, they park the car in your in your neighborhoods, and they're gone all day, and you would, or, or longer, obviously now, mm -hmm. and people can't park then. So that's 
why we're having this discussion. Okay. And uh, and that's why I really want to pinpoint um, who's in favor and who's not in favor and why. All right. Well, so well, everybody on the block has discussed okay. it. And most and, um, the ones okay. that's not here are in favor for. It. Well, I know on Hamilton Place. I don't know about the other streets. Yeah. But we definitely need something up there. Okay. Okay. That's that's what we're looking to do. Did she leave her? Uh, I did. Judith Carter. Yep. J Judith Carter, 214 Hamilton Place. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Thank you. Please in favor. Next, please. Good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Nicole Davis. I'm a resident at 221 Hamilton Place in Hackensack. I've been a resident of Hackensack for the last 17 years, 10 years on Hamilton Place. Uh, we have put together a small block association for people who live on Hamilton, such as Judy mm -hmm. um, and my neighbor right here on my left. Uh, and so here are our suggestions and recommendations and findings on our own. Um, please note that Mark Cheatham um, is on the zoning board and did reach out to traffic division to help get the study started. So there are several things in play. One. There are an excessive amount of cars on Hamilton Place for an extended period of time between 12 to 72 hours. We do realize that some of the 12 hour parking is as a direct result of the uh, rail system on Anderson, but we have another component with alternate side, people coming from Vanderpack and Anderson Street and leaving their cars for two or three days, which then creates a problem of us that are residents not being able to park. From Clarendon to Vanderbeck, there are only two houses that do not have driveways. They're really up the creek because they don't have a driveway. For the rest of us that have driveways, uh, if you have more than two cars in your household, you don't have a place for your additional car and or family friends and visitors. Um, it is challenging and our thought is that a sticker is needed, but the question on the floor is who can have the sticker? Because if I have, parenthetically, zone two, and that is Hamilton and Anderson, that doesn't alleviate my problem because the Anderson people are still coming over. If I have a sticker that says zone two for Hamilton only, that helps alleviate the problem. And then my final question is, I looked at your form and you have different hours of operation for stickers. So what then would be the recommendation for Hamilton Place to make it? Some, some of those hours are based on, because teachers get them in the district. So they have, because some of the schools have no parking lots. So the okay. teachers have to have a place to park. Um, but I agree. And I, I was wondering if we could do it by the, each sticker would have the street name on the sticker, maybe be a different color, and that would, color would take care of that issue right then and there. The thought was that if we could have this meeting tonight, make sure that there's enough residential support for this operation, then we need to have a meeting with our police department and, and basically sort out this sticker, color, location issue, which has not been addressed citywide, and see if we can bring some clarity to it. Yeah, that would be great, because my second question would be, if we had stickers, how would that then be policed? Mm. It, you know, is it a sticker in theory or is it a sticker that, oh, you've really been here for 48 hours and you're not supposed to, or right. oh, you've been here for 24 hours. So we want to be neighborly, please don't get it wrong, but for the That's tax true. dollars that are spent for homeowners, when my husband comes home who works overnight and he can't find a space at 5 a.m. or someone has now blocked part of our driveway trying to create a space that doesn't exist and he's got to find an officer Understood. and have that car towed, it just becomes worrisome and a problem that homeowners do not want to necessarily endure. It's, it's certainly not a neighborly thing to do. So, so, all right. I thank you for your comments so and that I'm, answered I'm our question. I'm representing Hamilton. If you have more to say about Hamilton. 53 years. 53 years. Okay. okay. Year thank you, ladies. Yes, thank you. Next, please. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Stephan Neustadter, and I live at 279 Hamilton. And these 
two women are right on point. Um, essentially, it was made starkly apparent to me when I came home on Monday. Now, Monday is a day on, on, on R Street where you can park on both sides. I could not, I had to circle about four or five times before I found the spot that someone had just vacated, vacated on the whole area down towards the train station. Now, uh, another issue I would like to raise that I think has bearing on this is that we suspect that there are houses being used as boarding houses because we see, and we have mentioned this, this has been mentioned to the building, to the inspection department. They came in and, and nothing seems to have been done about it. And we have a very strong suspicion that one of the houses on the Anderson and Clarendon is a, what do you call it? What you? Yeah. Airbnb. Airbnb. It's just an Airbnb. Oh, yes, yeah. because, because someone mentioned, one of my neighbors mentioned it to me, and I've just been looking, and I see different cars there every several days. You know, I, I, I figured the holidays people have different cars. Mm -hmm. I figured the holidays there are more cars on the street. It's accepted. But th this really has to, th this is really serious. It, it is. Now, we, I'm retired. We have three cars because we have to take care of a family in Brooklyn. And, and, and yes, I'm one of the guys that leaves this street car on the street a lot of time, but I move as the, the parking says, you know, I do, mm -hmm. because the police, God bless them, ticket you, and I say more power to them. You're, you're one of the time, few. <laughs> but, but again, I think they're right on point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor? Uh, yes. For the record, we, um, including the zoning officer, our city attorney, myself, and several hand-picked department heads, just had a, a revisit of boarding houses and Airbnb, which Mr. Kleiman, our city attorney, is working on updating our ordinances to address these concerns. So it's timely that you folks bring this up, but it's also rewarding to know that we're paying attention to the pulse of, as the city changes, we need to adapt and make sure that we're prepared to handle those new issues or conflicts as they come up. Um, I, this assignment just happened, so I'm not gonna pretend that this is gonna get addressed in the next 10 days or anything like that. But once we get past the holidays and we get into January of 2020, that, that assignment has been identified and we are working towards coming up with solutions to address these problems because they do affect neighborhoods and it does change things. Um, if you're living next to you know, Bob Smith and his family and they have two cars is one thing, all of a sudden Bob Smith takes a vacation and then there's eight cars there and none of them are residents and they just pop in and pop out, nobody knows. That's a condition that I don't know if the city is prepared to handle. So we are addressing them and I thank you for your time. Thank you, yes sir. My name is Dennis Ferrioli. I live at 384 Anderson Street in Hackensack. Um, I've lived there for over 21 years. Mm -hmm. um, previous to that, I'm almost a lifelong resident of Hackensack. I uh, grew up downtown. Um, and I have noticed over the years that cars that are not people who own the cars are not residing on the street, let alone maybe even not even in the neighborhood. Cars from Maywood, you know, when you have a sticker on the back of your car saying, my son's an honor student of Maywood Memorial School, that tends to tell you, That'll give it away. probably not from Hackensack. <laughs> so, um, you know, in addition to that, I see cars that are not, I live, uh, what, two blocks from Passaic Street where the bus stop is by the church there on the corner of Summit. And the cars that park on or in front of my house are not taking the bus, they're not taking the train. There's a car that parks notoriously in front of my house and my neighbors, and he goes back and forth, so Dean, the constable, doesn't give him a ticket for street sweeping or whatever. And 
I don't want to call the police department because they, they got bigger fish to fry than, than you know, me breaking their chops. So it's just a matter of the stickers are a great idea. How you delegate that is up to you guys. But I think when thinking about how you're going to penalize people, uh, residents or non-residents for not having the sticker, I don't think the fine can be severe enough because I'll tell you right off the bat, ten, twenty-five dollars, people will complain, but that's not going to change them from doing it. I think the more severe, the better, because you know, no more today, nowadays, no more next time, next time, next time. You just have to, you know, go for the jugular and just get it over with, because this has got to stop. I'm trying to. Say, I'm a, I love Hackensack. I've been here most of my whole life, except for five years when I moved away for a short time. This has to really stop. I can't even sell my house because, I mean, let's not get into the taxes. But aside from that, um, you have somebody come up to your house that you love and take care of all these years. And yet there's a car that looks like it belongs in a junkyard sitting there, as the woman said previous to me. She lives on Hamilton. I live on Anderson, parallel to Hamilton. It's there three, four days in a row. And the only thing that moves it is the sign on the street saying street sweeping. Yeah. And then you go, look, the car is back on Hamilton. It doesn't go anywhere. It's on Hamilton or on Anderson. And this is, I don't want to say the plate number or the car because it might be somebody here. <laughs> but but, but it's, it's, just, it, you know, it's just a matter of, I mean, you know, something should be done and you're on the right track. It's yeah, we're we're that's why the dis discussion's happening. But uh, it, it's a slippery slope because yeah. they are public streets. Yeah. So to say, no, I, I yeah, you can't I, park I, yeah, here. I, yeah, yeah, I, I sound like but the as being the part of a good neighbor, we can certainly take that approach and say, listen, if you got to move your car, feel free to move it for the day, but yeah. don't leave it there for no, days. I mean, look, I'm 53 years old. I'm already the guy saying, get off my damn lawn. I'm yeah. already doing that. So right. it's just a matter of, you know, it just. I mean, I know it's off point, but the other thing is. I live across the street from a guy who's been probably in his house almost as long as I have, maybe a few years after me. And speaking of the Airbnb, this is not an Airbnb, but there's no doubt this guy rents rooms. There's no doubt, um, you know, he leaves his two dogs in the backyard at two o'clock in the morning in bad weather. And they're barking, barking, barking. Mm. My new neighbor across the street, they're from Brooklyn great people, but they're used to barking dogs at 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, you it's know? not that kind of neighborhood. And they also park their commercial vehicles in the driveway. Another off-point subject, but look, I, I've been spending money for 20 years downtown by Route 80, parking in Hackensack mm -hmm. in the yard space for my business. You know, little old me does it. Why can't this guy who has a, grill. a meat delivery truck, um, all kinds of, I mean, it's just, it really is a beautiful neighborhood, went to school here, grew up here, but it's, you know, if I, if you have to ask me which way this direction is going, it's downhill. Okay. That's it. Well, we will definitely uh, address the commercial truck issue. Yeah. Um, and if you want, I have the address, but not on me. I can call up tomorrow and give it to the... Here. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Next, please. Hello, uh, my name is Natividad Lopez. I reside at 230 Anderson Street. Uh, my concern regarding the stickers is um, on snow days. If, if we have a sticker for a car, uh, we're supposed to park on, and on Anderson Street, nowhere else. We don't know yet. If it snows, then because Anderson Street Anderson is a, is a snow route, it, there's a sign on Anderson Street no, saying snow down. route. So, but what we do, what we do supply as a city, for all our snow issues, is we allow the city lots to be used during the time that they're plowing. In other words, if your street, and it may be a whole day that you'd have to park there, but we do allow down by Atlantic Street Garage or Lot C or other lots that we have downtown for cars to residents to go park so we can get the streets clean. Once they're cleared, then you can put your car back. It's not an issue because it doesn't need to be plowed anymore unless the storm is continuing and it's a really large storm. 
But that said, uh, that's that's all up for discussion because this is the beginning of the discussion. After tonight, we'll we'll take the next step forward and talk to traffic. How would we handle uh, Anderson, for instance, because it's a snow route? How would we handle that? Um, and, and things of that nature. I mean, you know, you know, both sides of the street parking sometimes or you know, or change. We could help alleviate some problems with that. Uh, when it's a snow situation, but that's something we need to discuss further further down, but it's a good question It's something that would definitely be brought up um, Also, my my husband um, We have a, where I live the building. We have one spot behind the building in the park, you know mm -hmm. parking lot. Um, My husband sometimes comes, you know, he comes he works. I don't work uh, He works sometimes I park outside so you know when they're cleaning street cleaning or whatever um he can park in the back he comes late there's no parking on anderson street right um so the stickers would be only for one car and that particular car with the sticker would have to park no, on the street you could buy two if you have two cars you could buy two two yeah. stickers it's ten dollars it's okay ten cents a week for for your lifetime it's a one-time deal and the only reason I've, you know, we, we had a group of people here several months ago who were totally opposed to doing this in their neighborhood because of the $5. And I was like, well, we have to charge you something. And they've charged $5 for the last 20 years. So that's the $5. And they were opposed to it because of the $5, which I can understand that. But, you know, we can't start doing it for free. And it's minimal. At $5, it's, you know, 10 cents a week or whatever it works out to. But uh, not a problem. $5 is not a problem. Yeah. But, no, I know. it's. Hopefully it's not. But. I also wanted to say something regarding the lighting. I'm not sure if I'm there in the right meeting or I can just, you know. Uh, you can mention it quickly only because yeah. I see one more person wants to speak. But yeah, there was a, an, instant, a, a, an instance, a, well, actually two times, but the second time I almost got hit by a car. I don't know if they were doing delivery. They were going very fast down Anderson Street and it was late and it was dark. Mm -hmm. And the street is very dark. So I don't know if there's that throughout the city. Yeah, we're we're running through that issue a lot lately. Public service, some of the new lighting they have is not really. We're hoping they go to the new brighter LEDs. We're actually in discussion with them right now because this is a citywide problem with people complaining it's dark out with these new bulbs they put in, and uh, hopefully this is something we can fix in the future because it, it's it's a safety problem, no doubt. The speeding, we move the trailer from place to place on a regular basis. I don't know if you've seen it, it lights up. Anderson, I know my son lived on Anderson. It was, it was he lived in uh, Somerset, which is kind of near you guys. And um, we did have an additional stop sign, I believe, on Clarendon mm -hmm. in Anderson. Which we had, which helped tremendously, in my opinion. State made us take it down. So, uh, you know, you try to do the right thing, but sometimes the powers that be don't want to see that happen. All right, thank you. Thank you. But, but if, excuse me, before you leave, if if we can resolve, you know, your questions and stuff about the snow, are you in favor of the resin sure. stickers? Okay, good. Oh, thanks. All right, thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. My name is Reverend Gladys Brentson, and I also reside at 230 Anderson Street. I have a couple of questions that I would like to ask you. Sure. Um, if you have this to go through. I was interested to, to know about when you get your um, sticker, uh, suppose you come home and Anderson Street, you know there's no park. With Clarendon, Vanderbilt, and Hamilton, mm -hmm. would you get a ticket if you park on either one of those streets? Are you being a resident? It's street specific. That's we're going to try as we're looking at from what we're hearing now that it should be street specific because people are parking their cars in front of other people's houses. In other words, if it's my day to move my car, I'll move it two blocks over and leave it there for five, six days until it's their day to move it. And then I move the car. That's that's the that's kind of what I'm understanding here. And uh in my opinion, that's not the neighborly thing to do is park your car in front of somebody else's house because just because you needed to move it for one day, you move it for the time you needed to move it, then you put it back by your house. That's that's my opinion, but uh, and I think that's the opinion of a lot of the people in this in this room. But um, I think it would be street specific. Otherwise, it's going to create a problem. If you don't, people are going to be parking in front of everybody else's block. So that means if you come in and all the parks are taken on 
and assume then you won't have no place to park? Well, because that street is always filled up. Where we're, we're, we're hoping and part of the investigation will be, and I'm going to direct the city manager to do a study mm -hmm. to see how many, what cars are parked there on a regular basis, okay? How many of them are commuters going to use the train station? Because we can find that out, just like Mr. Ferrioli said. You got a bumper sticker on your car saying, my, my child's an honor student in Maywood. Chances are you're going to take in the train and park, parking down there. So we're going to try to eliminate, try to gather the information on what cars are, are basically commuters using the trains and what cars are local people living maybe a block away who just you know moved their car there and decided to leave it there for another four or five days. So we can, we can figure that out through traffic and that's something uh, we will have to do I think in order to move forward with any of this. You can't just, you know, we're not going to go in reckless and just start saying, well, here's your sticker, here's your sticker, you can't park here, you can't park there. we got to find out who's parking there first, all right, and address it. And what, I'm sorry. What about when you have a guest? Um, they're not a resident, you know, and they want to come and visit you for a couple of days, you know? Well, you can't, that's, you know, that, that could be an issue. It could be an issue. If you do have a driveway, I would recommend that you put that person in the driveway and you park, and you park, on, the and you park on the street. Or I would ask for if you have you know, a neighbor to help you out in that situation. But uh, they're not going to issue a, uh, guest a, a either a guest ticket or they're not going to issue a, a resident sticker to someone who doesn't live here. Because then you're opening a whole other can of worms. Right. Yeah. No, I'm just wondering, would that person get a ticket? By oh, yeah. If they were parked... Yeah, yeah. So then where would they park, you know? That's, that's a good question. It's something we have to discuss. Something we have to discuss. I mean, the parameters of this, you know, it seems the farthest north, north it goes is Prospect Avenue, and certainly we don't want to impose on, on people on their areas either going up north. So mm -hmm. something we need to, that's why this is a discussion, so we can sit and figure it all out. All right? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, please. I'm Mary Ellen Shaw. I'm a 30-year resident of the condo building at the corner of Franklin and Hamilton. 30 years, the population density on the street alone has doubled. We've got two sets of townhouses in there. We've got, we used to have an old folks home on Clarendon. Now we have eight, two families there. There's those people park on the street. My neighbors who have driveways, they park on the street. In fact, one gentleman, so to speak, on our block manages to take up six spots with four cars because he doesn't want anyone parking in front of his house. Um, leaf removal, and there may be a couple of boarding houses on that street as well. There's, mo there's people who may just have big families, but there definitely seem to be a couple of houses that have unrelated people in there. I don't ask questions, but there's a lot of parking on the street. Since I've been there, three new high rises have been up on Prospect in the general area. That brought the public parking on the street down to about nothing. There's only hand enough room for handicapped spots. That pushes all the parking north on Prospect and Hamilton on the other side street. Now, when I come home, I live right on that corner there. Um, but half the time, I'm parking on Prospect because Hamilton is all parked up. Uh, the people are not so nice about how they park. Um, I have a problem with when we get um, the leaves blown into the streets, we lose parking that way. Snow non-removal causes huge problems. We're on that corner there. I've seen times where that corner is not plowed out to the tune of there's 20 feet of snow. You can't, you lose about five, six spots right there. Um, days go by. They, they've plowed once, they don't come back again. It's a nightmare. And I'm sorry, but I will not be able to walk from my car parked on Atlantic, in, over on the parking area on Atlantic. I have enough trouble walking right now. I'm a senior, I have some back issues. I drive around looking for a parking spot close to the building, and usually I have to park and empty my groceries out into the front of the building 
and then get back in the car and go find a parking spot for it. Doesn't make me happy. But I'm not sure that the permit, so you would think I would want a permit, but you're limiting the parking too much. I mean, I have to be able to park on the next block up on Hamilton. I have to be able to park on Prospect because there's just simply too many people on that block of Hamilton between Prospect Franklin and Clarendon. Also, there's not enough Tuesday, there's not enough Friday parking. Right where I am, there's parking for um, Hamilton on the uh, two sides of the building that are no parking Tuesday, which means those are the only places to park on Friday. You know, that doesn't work. One of my recommendations would be to change some of the timing on the off street parking. The Tuesday, 7 to 10, is, is too early. The Friday only seems to work because it's later and most people have moved. I feel that most of the people parking there that don't live on that street are from the buildings up on Prospect because there's not enough parking for people there. Um, but literally, the parking, the, the, the population on just that one block alone has doubled since I've been here. I mean, people are people. Everybody's got to have a car to get places. People, my neighbors don't always park in their, their driveways. Some of them deliberately park out front to keep people from parking out front. That's not right. I hope those are not the people you're hearing these complaints about. And I definitely do not want the parking permits to be specific to streets. It should be just a generic area. I, I mean, that's crazy. Where am I going to park at, at my age and my walking capability if, if I can't get right on that block, which is basically impossible. The townhouses are impossible. I mean, what about people have family and friends over? You know? The, there are possibly a couple spaces I would like you to consider adding to the parking. Redesign that intersection with Franklin and Hamilton. I mean, there's, I mean, there's like, I don't know how wide that street is. What is it, 90 feet or something at that one? It's one of those streets with the islands in it. And also, one of those islands, why can't we park there? There's no parking on either side of that little island. Uh, surely there could be some spots opened up there. Then also, when you come, if you're in Hamilton and you're coming east down the hill, on your, you, you have the one stop sign, and then, you know, I don't know, 50, 60 feet later, you have another stop sign. Sorry, sorry. Um, that's probably more freezing rain. Um, you have a whole area where there's, there's no parking. There's plenty of room to park there. If you brought the stop sign out, further so people could see there'd be four or five spots there and that could be more parking. That's, that's something right. traffic will we can look into that but yeah. the, in the other part to, to answer your question about some of the who are some of these people parking in some of these spots you know our traffic division will figure that out because I they have that, that opportunity. I think who's parking by us on Franklin and Hamilton is people from the high rises from possible. Well we can find that out. Yeah. Correct. And then we're parking on Hamilton where we can and prospect and also up the block on Hamilton. That's all part of the process, yeah. finding that out. So my idea is just to have a zone, parking pit permits for the zone. We're getting moved twice a week because of the street sweep and snow cleaning. And also there is an issue with the leaves and there's very definitely an issue with the snow plowing. Okay, I mean, well, there. he's going to address, definitely, Ms. Shaw, he's going to address the, the snow issue. But. Years, and I've only seen the plows get close to the curb. I mean, okay. Well, one of, the, one of the problems we have on in Hamilton is not a snow route, I don't believe. But, you know, no, it's not. Snow routes are, are imperative, or it's so important to get them clean because they're used for emergency vehicles and other things. But, but I've but. also been there, and the snow plow comes through once, and that's it. We're on our own. Three days later, we still have that. Okay. I mean, a lot of times we just get lucky. All right. we're, we're, I gave you probably four minutes over your three minutes. I have oh, somebody sorry, waiting. Yeah, no, you're okay. way past your three. Okay, but thank you for listening. Thank you. Next, please. Regina DePasqua, Parker Avenue. I just want to add my two cents to this discussion because I, my neighborhood was the first ones to have stickers. We've had them for over 15 years. So if you're going to be tweaking and doing things, take us into consideration too. The weekends, 
two hours. You have a guest. They can't park. You can't. You can't maybe accommodate all your guests in your driveway. Can we tweak it for the weekends? Like Monday through Friday is the two hours. If it's not on week, who enforces it on the weekends anyway? I mean, very nobody, rarely. Nobody. And very rarely is it enforced. I didn't, I didn't even know it was it carried on to the weekends. Yeah, it didn't originally, and I don't know when it changed. I didn't know. We it found did. out when our guests started getting tickets. Right. You know that was that was the problem. To it have shouldn't. it on the weekends, even though for us it's the hospital, it's the bus, it's whatever. You don't have the commuters right. that you, you have Monday through Friday. You don't have the volume. No. But if you want to have a guest. Two hours, you're out, you know, go move your car I, or whatever. I tend to agree with you. I don't know that this should carry on to weekends. Yes, but. and then enforce it during the week because, quite honestly, you know, I'll come home and I can't park in front of my house, but thankfully I have a driveway, and I like to, to juggle so my, my husband comes home later, I leave before, so I have to go out and move my car when he gets home or whatever. But there'll be a car there, you know, all afternoon, and... I can't, what am I supposed to time it, the two hours? I don't know when it got there. I don't right. know how long it's there, you know, but I know it can be enforced. It do it, you know, in pockets, you do it in neighborhoods and people will move on and find another place to you park. You are 100% right. Enforcement is the key. Mm -hmm. you know, you're never gonna get an argument from me on that and doing anything else on any other areas, any other neighborhoods would be a waste of time if we're not going to enforce it. So I agree with you. So, and I've lived with it for all these years. Mm -hmm. Just got a new car, had to get a new sticker. Happily got a new sticker so I could park on my block. Good. So it works for you a little bit, though, right? It works for the most part, but if it's enforced. Okay. Got to be enforced. Right. I mean, no, 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 no law is any good if it's not enforced. So, but... Uh, Next. Okay, need anybody else in the public? One question, Regina, but yours sure. is yours is a zone, not by street, right? Just out of curiosity. Where you are is it right. it's a general zone. Right. It's just a general zone. Just I, yours was done for two reasons. One is obviously the hospital and one is and the school is right there. And the bus bus stop is there. So all right, motion to close to the public. Offer. All in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Okay. You can't speak to Onward. You don't print it every they can't, can't speak twice. I'm sorry. You don't print it every <laughs> Crazy rule, but it's a rule. Okay. You can you can speak again at the public session when we open it up after this. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Number two is a discussion on the in, on the introduction of the food truck ordinance. Um, Steve, you've had lots to do with this, so I'm just yeah. Going to I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't even know where to begin in terms of questions, but certainly. Um, this ordinance, um, you know, does allow greater access to food trucks, though we're going to be starting it out by allowing them to operate specifically within um, a restricted area, namely what's known as the M2 zones within the city. Um, let me just pull this up here. So, um, you know, it, it creates a pretty comprehensive regulatory uh, scheme that um, you know basically says look a mobile food vendor will have to get a annual license they will pay $150 for that annual license um, then at that point um, and they'll you know obviously have to meet all the various requirements to ensure that the Department of Health and the fire department um, are confident that the food truck or other vendor can safely operate then at that point, um, uh, the property owner in a you know in an M2 zone would have to apply for a uh, a zoning permit to be able to allow the food truck to for it to allow a food truck to operate on the property. So the food truck um, it, it could be you're allowed one food truck at a time unless there's a special event, but it can be a different food truck every day so long as that food truck has the annual um, operating permit to operate as a food truck. Um, uh, and then at that point, the, um, the food truck operator, right, you have your permit to operate on that property, you've got your license, would file with the Department of Health um, a, a schedule of when it would be operating on a particular property so the Department of Health would know 
you know, when and where food trucks are operating and if needed, need be to conduct inspections. Um, and, um, you know, at that point, then they could um, operate on that property. Um, so there's no limitation anymore. I think that was an issue that was raised at, in previous meetings is, you know, previously there was a limitation that a food truck vendor could only operate a, a certain number of times during the course of a year. Um, and a property could only host a food truck a certain number of times, certain number of times of the year. So those restrictions have been eliminated, um, but there's uh, some more control that's put into place so we know when and where and how food trucks that are serving non-prepackaged food specifically are going to be operating within the city. Um, you know, again, the, the, the ordinance has certain provisions to deal with special events, festivals, fairs, carnivals, where, you know, someone can go to the city manager and say, hey, look, you know, we're going to have a, a, a festival on our property, so it's going to be five days. We want to have additional food trucks, and, and it'll be limited and controlled uh, to those circumstances. But for ordinary, everyday use, as I said, it'll be fairly limited because a property can only have one food truck at a time. Um, you know, even if it's uh, pretty consistent. And I think the thought process from speaking with everybody was, you know, let's get this into place. We don't have really any regulations to deal with this issue now. So if we do this, we can see how it works. We can see if it works well, if it needs to be adjusted, if it works well, whether to consider expanding the areas where food trucks may operate, if it doesn't work well, considering further restrictions at this point. But at least this will allow... Uh, you know, some opportunity for, uh, you know, food trucks to come in with, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more ability to operate than we previously discussed uh, based upon the council's concerns. And we've gone over this with the health department, the building department, the fire department, the city constable, the city manager's office. So, you know, everybody's reviewed this and thinks um, the way we're going to regulate this makes sense. And, you know, obviously we'll, we'll see how it goes and make adjustments as need be, but at least let's get something on the books to address the issue because it's certainly not going away. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, next is the uh, discussion, the resolution of Chapter 170 Parking Ordinance. Um, <laughs> so the Chapter 170 Parking Excuse Ordinance me. is something that has been um, uh, discussed at some time. Uh, the bottom line of this ordinance is that the uh, price for pretty much all of the city's parking meters is going to be a um, dollar an hour. Uh, one garage and one street near the medical center will be a dollar twenty-five an hour. Um, there's some adjustments to monthly parking fees that are going to go up um, uh, slightly. Uh, public parking lots are going to go from seventy-five to a hundred dollars per month. Um, the public parking structure, so that's the Atlantic Street parking garage, that's going to go from $85 to $110 per month. Um, the, um, the Hackensack University Medical Center um, parking garage, um, there are some residents that can access that garage. That's going to go from $25 to $35 per month. Um, and again, you know, we're trying to make everything, you know, pretty much as consistent as possible. A lot of our meters were already a dollar, uh, you know, per hour, but some of them were, uh, you know, 75 cents per hour. Um, and based upon the need for parking and the use of these spots, um, and with due consideration that, uh, you know, Hackensack's parking meters, you know, quite frankly, have been less than most surrounding communities that have, uh, you know, similar types of activity in the town. Um, the recommendation from the city's parking professional was that that these are are reasonable rates uh, to go forward with. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> next is on uh, number four is a um, resolution for uh, class two specials. Uh, class two specials are police officers that work for the city on a part-time basis, but are completely trained and PTC certified, which means Police Training Commission. These uh, officers are used to supplement our police department, but they have to go through the training. So we have seven people 
will be attending the Bassett County Police Academy um, for the position of Class 2 Special Officer beginning January 7th. So I need the council's approval for these officers to begin their training. Um, they, they're they not in the pension. They're not, they're, they're at an outside hourly rate. They're um, flexible. They're on an on-call basis, so to speak. So if we have an emergency, we can call these individuals out and they supplement our full-time officers. Um, they're really a great training situation for them personally and also a great asset to the city because they augment and supplement our police department. And I'd urge the council to approve that. Okay. Uh, next is number five, a discussion of the removal of a handicapped spot at 39 Broadway. By the removal of this handicapped spot, we will then be um, in the process of putting a um, crosswalk in that intersection. Um, so the removal of this handicapped spot will make the ability for us to add a, cross, um, a crosswalk for uh, pedestrians near the school. Any, any issue? No, I noticed it was put in in April 4th of 2006 and the traffic department said it's no longer used by okay. anybody handicapped. Uh, so. Number six is a uh, discussion um, for News 12 uh, media services, which would be an enhancement to the city and our information that's supplied to the public. Um, this didn't come formally to me initially. Um, I have not had the time to discuss this with our um, retained um, vision media that, that handles most of our presentation, but before we make any of those outreaches, I want to know if there's any support from the mayor and council that want to facilitate this or, or, or use this process. Personally, I think everything has to go through the PR firm that manages the PR for the city. I don't think we should be making many decisions without their input. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, next. Um, next is the December 10th bond anticipation note sale. Jim Megan, our CFO, was here. Jim, could you assist? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, yeah, here tonight to uh, uh, just uh, let you know the results of our December 10th uh, bond anticipation note sale. Just by way of background, uh, quickly, um, every bond ordinance that we do uh, that incurs debt contains a provision that uh, authorizes the CFO to buy and sell notes or basically to borrow the money as we see fit. Um, that's what we did on December 10th with our uh, note sale, which was $9,415,000. Uh, just so you know, as a policy, uh, we only borrow money um, as we need it. Uh, some municipalities borrow everything that they can. Uh, we don't do that. Um, we only borrow it as we need it. A bond anticipation note uh, lasts for one year. So we review both what we've purchased in the last year, what we plan to purchase in the next year, and uh, we borrow accordingly. Uh, so on December 10th, uh, we had a note sale. What we do is we put it out to bid. Uh, the bid is for the lowest interest rate that's being charged. We had four bidders. Uh, all four bidders bid at 2%. Um, which isn't unusual. So what they do, in addition to bidding an interest rate, uh, they bid a premium. And a premium is cash uh, that can be used by the city. And we use it uh, as a tiebreaker. Okay? And in this case, you know, all four bidders bid 2% with a premium. Uh, the low bid was from Jeffries LLC, which in addition to a 2% interest rate, included a premium of uh, $65,812. So to determine the low bid, what we do is we factor the premium into the interest rate. So in reality, uh, the interest rate is 1.29%. Okay. I, again, according to our bond ordinances, I'm authorized to buy and sell notes um, as we see fit, and I'm required by law to, re to report the results at the next succeeding council meeting. Okay. Okay. Good. 
All right, excellent. Thank you, man. Thank you. What was that? One point what percent? Uh, the net interest rate was one point two nine nine percent. Wow. And just so you know, the the second a low bidder, um, it was only it's a nine point four million dollars was a difference of only six hundred dollars, or <laughs> wow, less than one one hundredth of one percent. It's close. Very close. Okay. okay. Thank you. And, and lastly is number eight <clears throat> is a um, approval of um, an, a utility easement for 149 Main Street and 150 State Street. Um, there's a developer who needs to have uh, an updated power source to the building because the old building was removed, new ones put up doesn't meet the needs or demands of it. Um, Albert and I and some other staff have not, Albert, please step up and you can fill in some of the gaps of this. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I would caution that there may be some negotiations here, so we should be very careful not to so, uh, go beyond anything generally except in closed session. Right, so the only reason why I bring this up is there seems to be a timeline that we're obviously holding back the process of this building and this redevelopment project. So basically, I'm gonna ask the mayor and council to entrust the city manager with the, the ability to negotiate this and resolve this conflict because one, we're not gonna have another meeting and I don't wanna shove this and tell this gentleman that we'll see you sometime in January because time is money and as this time goes on, Albert, maybe you can I will just try to set it up um, factually a little bit better just to, to, to have on the record without getting into uh, too right. many of the particulars. But we're talking about the uh, what was the old Woolworth building at 149 Main Street. Uh, Woolworth. Woolworth. Woolworth building. Um, the, there's, there's no power accessible from Main Street. This is something that the developer, the owner, found out later in the game. The way that that building had been powered previously was a power line that was accessed via State Street across the Seatown parking lot, if you can visualize this. That single aerial line is not nearly enough to power this building. So after several conversations with PSC and g through our project manager's office and with the assistance of our council, it was determined that the only way to power this site is through the city-owned parking lot that pretty much surrounds Seatown, if you can visualize it. Visualize it. It's an odd-shaped lot. So we, at the, the, the developer's expense, we secured up appraisals for what is essentially a 10-foot wide easement with 10-foot on either side that you can never build on, which it effectively makes it a 30-foot wide easement stretching the length from State Street to the project development at 149 Main Street. We secured an appraisal for that, and we secured another appraisal for a separate a piece along the back of 149 Main Street in anticipation of possible future development, which would allow us to tee off of that one line coming off to State Street to possibly power projects, other projects along Main Street, given that there's limited access and really no access for beefier projects along Main Street and possibly Warren. The idea was maybe we can do reciprocal easements and, tra and trade. You have access to the city easement, the city in the future will have access to easement to the uh, to your easement in the back of your property, um, which I know our council will get more into the particulars to whether or not that's appropriate. But with as the manager explained, what we'll be looking to the council for is some sort of authority to come up with a number that is fair, all things considered, to be able to move the project along, power the site in a way that fully respects and appreciates the city's land rights to this property. Okay. The only thing I would ask is if anything that could have an adverse effect on the city that we are told about it. Yep. And again, I'll, I'll brief a little bit more in closed session about the specifics of, you know, values and, and how we would propose to, you know, address this issue in discussions with the various stakeholders. And this brings more money to PSE&G, so that should be part of our negotiation. Yes, Ted. We can only try. That would complete. Albert, thank you. Thank you. That Thank would complete you. the city manager's report. Okay, I need a motion to open to the public, please. Offer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody from the public who'd like to speak, please come forward. Give your name and address to the clerk, and you will have three minutes. 
And this one we have to enforce at three minutes because we still have to go in closed session. Yeah, you you should have been here earlier. What are you giving you five? You got that one. Right. Okay. Good evening, Kathleen Sarrow. Um, I thank you for uh, eliminating the handicapped spot, which will make us go through and be able to put the horse walks. And this is very time sensitive. So does this need to be read twice or is this a done deal at the one reading? The removal it's of an it. ordinance to read. All right, so we have to wait till next month to go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, anticipation for that. We should move forward to um, speaking to the project manager, also to New Prince Company, and they could, they could do it for us because they're gonna do a certain amount of handicap um, ramps right after the holiday. So, like I said, this is time sensitive, and this this, this coursework is needed. You know, it needed was needed like last year. So, if we could put that on on the um, the list of the ones that have put it in with the ones that are being done, that would be very appreciated. And now these people will have a a safe way to cross the street because we already lost two people for jaywalking this year because there wasn't a um, specific spot for them to cross. So. By designating crosswalks, they can cross safely using the crosswalk. Um, also, we need um, a crossing guard at that crosswalk because we only have one, and poor Chris has to move the barricades every time the buses come in, and he has to do a whole bunch of things, so we can't watch people on one side and watch people on the other side. And they were wishing for, um, what do you call them? those, uh, Estro, what are the ones that they use for the school, those offices, they could definitely use one there because they would make the buses go up further and they would prevent, they would, it's a lot of safety issues there. So we would like one of those, um, what do you call them? There's, there's letters for them. So S -S -O SLEO3s. Okay, whatever, to be an issue, uh, what do you call assigned to that school. Um, okay, that's it. And I have a problem with the one bench that's located on Ward Street mm -hmm. as you make that hairline turn and you're coming into Hackensack where the barrier is, uh, and it's facing backwards, so if somebody's gonna get whacked, they're not even gonna know they're gonna get hit because the, the, the thing the back, you're facing, your back is facing the street. And also for snow removal, there's no way you're gonna get that cut and plow that snow, it's gonna go over that bench. So that placement of that bench is very, very dangerous. And I don't know who put it there and why, but um, it's, not, it's not a good place to want, want anybody to be seated. Uh, the ones we put on Hudson Street, we had them. We all took them out, and that's how they're in the park next door to, to the bakery that I own. Because you just can't put anything on the curbside, because people jump the curb. Or I, I know you don't want your feet dangling, but you also don't want your back to the to the uh, the street, because you want if a car's going to hit you, you want to see it coming. Thank you. Thanks, please. <laughs> One three nine Ricardo, please. Um. I see there's been a lot of talk and also a lot of uh, publicity about this uh, uh, proposition for uh, uh, two, two ways on Main Street traffic. I have some questions about that which uh, I think that are uh, pertinent. First is this, um, pedestrian safety, uh, this is a matter to consider, um, was it even considered here? I mean traffic control is my question here. Is the police department prepared to change its manpower tactics? In other words, I think I don't see any police directing traffic in this town much anymore, except perhaps if there's a uh, uh, some kind of a construction work done or an emergency of some kind. I was wondering or not if this is going to be able to deal with this, these proposed changes of a two-way traffic on Main Street. If, if you know, uh, a second question is this, um, uh, how does the removal of all traffic, uh, bus traffic, serve the needs of the public of transit riders? I mean, we're talking about getting cars out of the city and reduce congestion. We're talking about, was Jersey Transit in the loop for this decision? And what happens to commuters who depend upon bus traffic? to get where they're going. I mean, that's, those are things that will be considered. Another thing is this, which I took note of. Uh, was there any serious impact study on the effects of the community, what's gonna happen with this stuff? I mean, before this decision was made, was it merely expedient or was it arbitrary or is it some kind of a um, exploratory, uh, I'll put it this way, experiment with what's gonna go on in the community here? As it stands now, I don't think we know about it. There's any impact studies that were made, or were, were 
imparted to the public in any way. I think people should know that. We already know that in Edgewater, there's a two-way traffic issue in that town with the um, city administrator, Mr. Uh, uh, Gregory France over there, was having some uh, uh, discussion with CBS News about it. People are having trouble crossing streets and they're getting hit over there. I can attest to the fact that traffic on Main Street in Hackensack can be, at best, quite perilous sometimes. So if the police are going to, are going to help out here and see their presence a little bit more uh, proactive, it would be a good thing. Because I, I don't think uh, the public is served by um, building new buildings and building new uh, um, opportunities for business to take place in, this, in the city if people are at risk when they shop. And uh, whether or not something should be done about it, I would hope the uh, city council here takes those matters into, into uh, consideration. And somehow the public is made a part of that decision. And um, that's, that's really all I have to say on the matter. And I, uh, another thing is also this removal of um, this, putting these uh, smart meters in for parking. Is it facilitating improvement or is it simply uh, just using the technology here to... Uh, uh, widen social divisions because there are people who have trouble with those things. People who are, you know, elderly people who may not have uh, you know, credit cards and things like that. So uh, I hope that, um, you know, that these matters can be clarified here for the public and something can be done about that. Uh, I, I'm open to any response on this issue. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I will respond and um, we'll give the rest of the council a chance to respond as well. Uh, tremendous amount of uh, effort and study went into bringing Main Street back to two-way. As many of you in this room know who have been here for quite a while, Main Street was in Bergen County in Hackensack, New Jersey, was the most successful shopping district in, in this county. Um, somewhere along the line, back in the early 70s, Main Street was converted to a one-way, which created a, a much more treacherous situation for pedestrians because now you have people only going from point A to B. That's it. And that was the reason they made it one way is to get people out of Hackensack and out of town. That is it. Um, the comparison of Main Street to River Road in Edgewater is doesn't hold water for me because we have Moore Street, we have River Street, and we have State Street paralleling Main Street. The object here to bring it back to two-way, which it was when it was at its you know most successful time, was to create a slower path of traffic um, so that people going from point A to B are not using Main Street. They're using a Main Street to get to the parking lots or to park on Main Street to go to one of the stores on Main Street. Um, I will say this, as part of the rehab plan, uh, it was determined that no development would take place in Hackensack if Main Street stayed one way. So none of this would be happening. So all this tax revenue that's going to be pouring into the city in the next five to six years would not happen if Main Street did not get turned to two-way. Um, that said, pedestrian-wise, I agree 100 percent. There has to be more police involvement. We've had this discussion uh, with the city before and hoping having more cops on the street, foot cops, helping uh, traffic cops, stuff of that nature to uh, assist because one of the bigger problems we're going to have on Main Street is right now with one way people get away with double parking because people can go around them. But that's no longer going to be available once it's two way. So that's going to have to be something that's enforced constantly. Um, the re removal of bus traffic um, did not impact the, as a matter of fact, New Jersey Transit even they had to approve it. We just don't make the buses change. It has to be approved by New Jersey Transit. It's not like they're not going up and they're not using Main Street as the thoroughfare. And they now use State Street and Moore Street and they cut across. So now they let you off either a half a block or a block away from where you were on Main Street. But the buses on Main Street would be a definite problem um, and were a definite problem even with one way. So that was the reason that was done and that's worked out quite, quite well, and we have no real uh, serious impact from that happening. Um, anybody else in the council want to speak to this? 
Right. Just to jump in with the buses, I mean, New Jersey Transit was actually happy about this because it would, they admitted it was more confusing because State Street was one way and Main Street was one way. Mm -hmm. So you would have to know, hey, I got off the bus on State Street, but if I want to go home, I have to know if I'm unfamiliar with this, that I have to get on the bus on Main Street. And you know, now they can get on and off the bus on the same street across from where they are, which is what's normal for most bus traffic. We were unique in that we had these two one-way thoroughfares in and out of town, as the mayor said. So that was you know, another point of why having the buses not on Main Street was a plus. And in, in many cases, they're being dropped off very close to the intersection of Main and those intersecting streets. So it really is not an inconvenience or, or, or a hardship. Um, Another thing about you know two-way traffic, when you have two-way traffic where both of those two-way lanes are single lane, right? you're not talking about four lanes of traffic, or you know, what you'd see on a river road or another busier street, um, it actually slows traffic down compared to two lanes of one way. So we're actually slowing the traffic down by changing the configuration. We now have, are in the process of installing um, uh, uh, self-adjusting lights so these traffic lights now anticipate when there's traffic and, and self-adjust and make that change. So the flow of traffic is actually going to be better than it ever was before on Main Street, which, which is another big plus. Um, the other thing about the meters, uh, our traffic meters still accept coin. So it's not that if you don't have a card or you, know, you, don't, um, you know, don't use your phone, they still will accept coins. So you can still put quarters in the machine just, just like you, you always did. I think I think we got all these questions. I, know I tried to make notes. Any other? I just also want to mention. Don't forget State Street, as Deputy Mayor mentioned, was one way. At the same time, Main Street was one way. I was literally told by several people that dozens of school children will die when we go back to two way and just nonsense like that. There hasn't been one injury, one uh, pedestrian hit that I know of or been aware of on State Street since it's gone to two way. And I haven't had one complaint, and it, it, it helps with the flow of traffic tremendously getting through the city. So, but uh, no one's no one's been hit. So, and uh, I'm sure that uh, during the transition on Main Street from one way to two way, we'll be fine. And, and we do need more of a police presence. And we've talked about this as a council. I agree, especially during the transition time. Once people get used to it, things will get better. You know, you know the rules, and you learn. You know, you learn how to drive with those rules. But I think during the transition period, especially with the bike traffic, Leo, right? We were counting them the other night. We were at dinner. Six bikes uh, again, twenty minutes. Yeah, that were riding on the sidewalks. Even though you know it's clearly posted that you're not allowed to ride a bike on the sidewalk. We were having dinner, and my granddaughter was with us, and so I had her counting. And like within a twenty-minute period. Mm -hmm. Six bikes went Six by bike. on the sidewalk, not on the street. Right. So I think having the police presence will get people used to what the rules are and learning how to abide by those rules, and that will also make it much safer. So I do agree with you on that point. Thank you. I'm sorry. Next, please. So my question is, having have my parents live at one end on the north end on Hamilton Place, mm -hmm. my grandparents on Green Street, I walked Main Street back and forth right. in the 70s. It was dynamic. There's nothing there. There's no stores. Every every block, a dollar. That's store. changing tremendously. I'm hoping because I'm That's like, what is changing your vision? tremendously. Only you seem to know There's it. over. Well, this has been yeah. well advertised throughout the city for the last five years. I mean, it's I mean, been award-winning projects and. I don't go down as far as growth. The first, all, all the new redevelopment, it, it, Main Street, which is 163 acres from the courthouse to Sears, mm -hmm. it's a 163 acre tract right. of land. We're doing jury duty. Right? We had designated <laughs> yeah. it's what's called a rehabilitation zone, which okay. is, makes it part of a state uh, plan, which allowed us to use pilot programs and other incentives to get these developers to come in. Because, like you said, nothing was happening since the 70s. Right. Nothing was happening. Right. Um, since then, we have multiple, multiple projects. There's going to be on Main Street alone probably over 2,000 new residents just living on Main Street because we don't have open space in Hackensack. We know that. So the only thing we can redevelop in order to bring revenue in is our downtown, which is nobody, you know, through the years, nobody really lived in downtown. It was just this, there were some apartments here and there, and there's a couple up by Sears, there's a couple apartment buildings, but not a lot, not compared to what there's going to be. But that said, you know, it's like that movie, Build It and They'll Come, the baseball movie. It's, you know, there's going to be a lot of new 
service well, type I'm of retail. Right. Because I'm not so much concerned about the living. Mm. It's nice if residents are there. But I before there was even a thought of putting residents right. there, I could walk from Passage Street mm -hmm. downtown all the way to Green Street. Right. And there were plenty of stops in between that we could go to. There were shops. Right. There was no, dynamic no. shopping like in Inglewood. Right. Or something. I go to Inglewood, I can walk up and down and go into different boutiques. Not little junky uh, we agree uh, we don't want we want to get rid of the nail cash, salon yeah. too many nail salons and check yeah. cashing dollar yeah. I mean, stores stuff like that that's owners, that but, that will change as the city redevelops there's no doubt about it you, you got to realize all the new buildings going up are required to have retail on the ground floor okay. there'll be no apartments on the ground floor so that's all new stores coming in and new buildings so it'll revitalize and and you know we, we talked the number the other day uh, one of the I can't remember who it was. I think it was Mr. Akamian. But he said, of the 2,000 units, if every unit owner spent $100 in Hackensack, $100 a week, right, which isn't really a tremendous lot of money. You go out to eat once and right. you go buy, go to the supermarket or, you know, to Aldi's or something else, 100 bucks isn't a lot. That's $200 million a year in, in uh, economic growth in the city of Hackensack just on that, just from that. So right. it's a tremendous opportunity for us. You know, when mm -hmm. we see that come back. Yeah. And, and I agree with you because this would be nice for us too as residents. You know, that right. we want to go down, we want to go to Main Street, we want to go with our children and our family. I, mean, I go down Main Street now, like I said, I'm doing jury duty. It's like I stay right there in that little part of it. But to walk the whole entire Main Street itself, it's nothing. Yeah. It's, it's, still, it's changing. It's still, We've seen a lot of new restaurants. It's five years, but believe me, it's the vision we have is going to be lovely. It's going to be lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Next, please. We'll just make sure. Mary Ellen Shaw, 303 Hamilton Place. Uh, circling back to pedestrian safety. I'm sorry. Can you, you speak into the microphone? Wait, Steve. We can't hear her. Oh, okay. Okay. There you go. Mary Ellen Shaw, 303 Hamilton Place. Uh, speaking on the issue of local pedestrian safety, I would love to see crosswalks along Hamilton Place at Summit, at Prospect, at Franklin, and Clarendon. I mean, it's very difficult to cross the streets there with the cars speeding by up Franklin, down Hamilton. Um, also at night, um, whether the lighting's good or not, it's still difficult, especially this time of year. That's all. Okay, thank you. We're actually doing an evaluation to certain parts of the city or new crosswalks. So, and Prospect's one of the streets involved. Hi. Mr. Ferrioli, how are you? I just wanted to um, talk about the two-way Main Street. It was, and you, you uh, stole my thunder by saying uh, it was two ways when I was a kid. Um, it's never been easier to get across town, considering my, my garage space for my business is down near Route 80, going up State Street. Whoever thought of that idea deserves a raise because I get through town in like five minutes now early in the morning, mm -hmm. where before you guys did that, I'd have to go up to uh, First Street and, and then up to Summit Avenue to get to Route 4. It's so much better now, and I just wanted to let you know that it's not everybody here is to, here to bitch. No, it's increased the flow of traffic. It definitely And a positive thing, and thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Hey, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Council, and happy holidays. Thank My you. name is Randy Glover, and I'm the creator, producer of Main Street Live Concert Series, Stolen and Renamed Sounds of Summer. But we know that already. I will actually address that at a later time period. Deputy Mayor Sims, I'd like to commend you for your work in the community for distributing turkeys during the Thanksgiving holiday and also for running the basketball program that has been established here in the city for so long. Um, but as an elected official of color, I do have some questions for you that I think uh, the people in the African-American community as well as the Hispanic community are interested in as well. And Councilman Pataglia, this, uh, this is also for you as well. Can you just, uh, you know, at uh, a, a decent time period, tell us what is the total capital investment thus far by the developers, and actually the whole council can get together and answer these questions <clears throat> to the community. 
How many developers are building in Hackensack currently? How many subcontractors are currently being used in Hackensack? What is the criteria to build in Hackensack? Are there any minority developers uh, building in Hackensack? Are there any minority subcontractors in Hackensack? Okay. Uh, are there any minority workers on the work sites? And if so, how many? Or what is the percentage of the minority workers? Uh, what are the terms of the pilots? How many pilots have been given so far to developers? Okay. And uh, do you plan to give any more and how many? And what do the residents actually receive in exchange for all of the pilots being given to the developers? What are the actual tax benefits for the residents of Hackensack? And can it be shown in black and white, line item for line item? This is, in, this is to include deferred items and offsets. Also, Deputy Mayor, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you to Trinity Baptist Church the second Sunday of January to address the congregation. Uh, if it's inconvenient for you, I'm sure we can come to Reverend Ross's church uh, where you are so you can address us. Um, and actually, if any of the council members would like to come to Trinity uh, on the second Sunday of January 2020, uh, we'll send an official uh, letter from Pastor Mays inviting the council members to speak to the community uh, about these issues. Anyway, thank you, Council, and happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Uh, just, just three items, and I'll be brief. One is the point made by the Block Association about the speeding is very vital. The speeding on, on our street is it's terrible. I think the sign, the, the traffic department put out a sign and that slowed things down a bit. Um, it's, you, you can't have a patrolman there all the time. Uh, maybe, uh, I'm just throwing this out, maybe in a speed bump. Now, I know speed bumps are problematical, but I'm just throwing it out. But it's a major problem. Number two, and I brought this up before, and I'm just going to belabor it. There is a very large PSG utility truck that has taken up residence on Clarendon and Hamilton. I wrote to the police on a number of occasions, and the, res the resolution was, I was told that the city has made an accommodation for PSE and G to park illegally because no. they're PSE and G. No, 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 that's no, not true. And, go ahead, I'll let you finish, but I'll explain it to you. It's okay. a little, little deeper than that, but go ahead. Okay, but the point is, at least if 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 there is an agreement, he should park on the in the no parking area. Clarendon has a no parking area and a parking area, at least you should have the courtesy of parking in the no parking area and freeing two or three spaces for residents on the other side of Clarendon. And, and, and the last thing is I want to wish you all happy holidays. Same to you, sir. A healthy, prosperous new year. If I could answer the uh, public service issue. Those trucks, along with uh, Suez Water, and uh, basically utility trucks. If you're on emergency call, which these guys are, they take their vehicles home and they park them there. Now, his car's at work, okay? If his car isn't at work, his car is where that truck is parked. So he's not, we're not giving him an extra spot, but they're there because emergency calls, they get called out at two, three o'clock in the morning and they have to respond to the whatever, whether it's in Hackensack or wherever they have to go, Suez Water, Public Service, uh, I think those are the only two we have. But uh, yes, they are allowed to because they're emergency service vehicles. That doesn't go for any commercial vehicle, just those special vehicles. Um, but take they, a gas leak. Well, then I, Stefan, his, his car would be parked there. 
most likely if the truck was wasn't then, there. Then my response is, if that's the case, mm -hmm. and that's the rationale, he should be instructed to park on the no parking side. And we're talking about a tight parking situation, right? And we're looking at three spots. That's something Ted could look into whether yeah. they can park in a no parking area. But I don't know if that you know, you're not telling somebody to park illegally. Yeah. There is a large no parking area, and Clarendon is a fairly large right. street. Mm -hmm. and it just seems to me. I can have a look into that. He's not blocking any differently if he blocks on that side. Yeah, but I, I, the only thing I would look at is why it's a no parking zone first before he looks into it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Good evening. I'm Blake Crawford, business owner at 55 and 58 Voorhees. I just wanted to take a moment to thank the council and the city manager and the city attorney for this rewriting of the mobile food vendors um, ordinance. I had a chance to read it uh, in the book earlier today. I just want to let you know I think it very fairly uh, represents the needs of all parties involved and um, improves sort of the vibrancy of the food and beverage culture in Hackensack. And I think we all we all want that. I think also going at it stepwise, like you're doing with the zones, is a very smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, Second thing is to let you know we're very excited about the two-way completion on Main Street because, as you know, most of our guests on the north side of town join us from the direction of Route 4. And it was a common complaint that we heard was that they'd love to go downtown, but the road went the wrong way and nobody could figure out how to get to Main Street from that direction right. if you weren't from the area. So um, kudos on that as well. So thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thanks, Blake. Anybody else from the public? Need a motion to close? Offer. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Need a motion to go to closed session? Offer. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed. Whereas Mayor and Council of the City of Hackensack deem it necessary to discuss certain actions under Section 7B7 and 7B8 of the Open Public Meetings Act, which pertains to matters falling within attorney-client privilege, ongoing litigation, and personnel matters concerning the employment of a current or prospective public employee. Whereas the Mayor and Council of the City of Hackensack is of the opinion that such circumstances may presently exist. And whereas the Mayor and Council wishes to discuss the following issues, personnel matters, ongoing litigation, matters involving attorney-client privilege, matters involving the purchase, lease, or acquisition of real property, any pending or anticipated litigation or contract negotiations. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Mayor and Council of the City of Hackensack deem it necessary to exclude the public from this discussion. The outcome of the discussion will be disclosed within 90 days or as that's, that's time as the interests of the city do not require confidentiality. Um, I'll be speaking to the council, sorry. I'll be speaking to the council about two matters. One is a litigation involving Underwood Properties. The second is I'll be pleased to brief the council about the city's victory in the recent lawsuit filed by Richard Salkin. Okay, we'll see everybody around eight o'clock. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Madam Clerk. We need a motion to close the executive session. Motion to close the executive session, please. Offer. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed? And a motion to close. Motion to close the cow session. Offer. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed? 